morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before I start, I just want to confirm that Commissioner Feldman, who is on WebEx, can see and hear us. I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. At this meeting, uh, CPSC staff will brief the Commission on draft notice of proposed rulemaking that would strengthen the existing toy standard and establish safety standards for water beads. Last year at our annual priorities hearing, we heard from several mothers whose children were injured after they ingested water beads. Since that time, uh, one child has died and more injuries have been reported. This proposal aims to reduce the risks to small children from these products. In a moment, I'm going to turn this over to staff so that they can brief us. Once they have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have questions that address statutory interpretation or legal advice, please don't ask them at this time. We'll hold a closed executive session at the end of this briefing if you want to ask such questions. Briefing us today, we have Matt Cressy, a project manager in laboratory sciences, mechanical, and Dan Weiss, assistant general counsel. Uh, Mr. Weiss is sitting in, in for Charlotte Alton, who is unable to be here today. I'm going to turn the microphone over now to Mr. Cressy. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Mr. Weiss. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Cressy. I'm a mechanical engineer with a, within the Directorate for Laboratory Sciences and the product manager for the Toy Water Bead Rulemaking Project. Today, I'm here with Daniel Weiss subbing in for Charlotte Alton, an attorney from the Office of General Counsel. Today, we will discuss staff's draft proposed rule for toy water beads intended to address the risk of death and injury to children who ingest, insert into their ears or nose, aspirate, or choke on toy water beads. Next slide, please. To set the stage, Daniel will provide background information and then discuss the statutory framework for this proposed rule. Then I will present a summary of the hazard patterns found in the incident data. I will also present staff's draft proposed rule, the potential small business impact, and staff's recommendations. Now I'll turn it over to Daniel to explain the applicable legal authority for this draft NPR. Next slide, please. Pursuant to section 106 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, the commission made ASTM F963 uh, the mandatory standard for toys and incorporated that by reference into 16 CFR part 1250. The standard was updated several times and the existing rule incorporates the 2023 version of the voluntary standard in uh, part 1250. The voluntary standard includes requirements for toys comprised of expanding materials. Uh, next slide. Uh, but does not include performance and labeling requirements specifically for water beads. The commission can issue the draft proposed rule pursuant to its authority under section 106 of the CPSIA. Section 106 requires the commission to issue safety standards for toys using the notice and comment procedure of the Administrative Procedure Act. The commission may proceed under 106D, which requires the commission to examine and assess the ASTM standard in consultation with consumer groups, product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts, and promulgate consumer product safety standards for toys that are more stringent than the voluntary standard if that would further reduce the risk of injury associated with toys. The Commission may also proceed under Section 106C, which requires the Commission to periodically review and revise the rules set forth under Section 106 to ensure that they provide the highest level of safety for such products that is feasible. And now Matt will explain staff's recommended uh, draft proposed rule. Next slide, please. So what are water beads? Water beads are various shaped liquid absorbent polymers which expand when placed in water. They can expand from a dry state of a few millimeters diameter to an expanded state of up to 50 millimeter diameter. Shown here on the left are examples of beads that can expand from two millimeter diameter to 16 millimeter diameter. And on the right, examples of beads that can expand from seven millimeter diameter to 50 millimeter diameter. Next slide, please. Toy water beads and toy water bead products are products designed, manufactured, or marketed as a plaything for children under 14 years of age. Some examples of toy water bead products shown here include toy experiment kits shown at the top left, 
Here, a child can use the supplied beads and grow them. Toy squeeze balls, shown on the bottom left, which have expanded water beads contained within the ball. Toy sensory kits, shown at the top right, which also have beads contained within various shapes. And then toy water bead guns, shown at the bottom right, which use wa water beads as ammunition. Next slide, please. Now I'll present the hazard patterns found in the incident data. Staff searched two CPSC maintained databases to identify incidents associated with water beads. The National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, or NICE, and the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System, or CPS RMS. Our collected NICE incidents occurred between January 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2022, while our collected CPS RMS incidents occurred between January 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2023. Based on the NICE data, we estimate 6,300 incidents related to water beads that were treated in hospital emergency departments. 48% were ingestion related, 36% were ear insertion related, 15% were nose insertion related, and the final 1% were related to other hazards. However, it is unknown how many of these incidents were toy related and how many were non-toy related. Next are the incidents identified in CPS RMS. These incidents involve toy water bead products. The most common hazard comes from ingestion of water beads, which included one death and 52 injuries. Reports included gastrointestinal blockages, vomiting, and abdominal pain. When a water bead was ingested, it was found that they would not fully expand until having passed through the stomach and into the connecting small intestine. Then once in the small intestine, they will fully expand where it would cause a blockage at the ileocecal valve, which is located at the end of the small intestine. Healthcare providers might not be able to identify the water bead blockage because expanded beads are radiolucent and unable to be identified via x-ray. Next, ear insertion reports included five injuries reporting inner ear damage and hearing loss. When a water bead is inserted into the ear, the water bead can expand and damage the inner ear structure. Beads which expand larger have the potential to grow deeper into the inner ear canal and cause more severe damage and become more difficult to remove by healthcare professionals and even require invasive surgery. Then nose insertion reports included four injuries reporting nasal tissue damage and congestion. When a water bead is inserted into the nose, the water bead can expand into the nasal cavity. Again, beads which expand larger have the potential to grow deeper into the nasal cavity and cause damage to the nasal mucosa and be more difficult to remove by healthcare professionals and also require invasive surgery. Then aspiration or inhalation of water beads. Reports included two injuries reporting airway obstruction. And these incidents, sorry, in these cases, a child puts beads in their mouth and then inhales a bead, risking blockage anywhere along the respiratory tract once expanded. And last, we have an incident which reported a child choking on an already expanded bead. Expanded water beads can be large, round, and smooth, which allows them to create an airtight seal, airtight seal within the airway. Next slide, please. Next, I will discuss current voluntary standard requirements. First up is the expanding materials requirement provided by ASTM F963, as it applies to toy water beads. The current ASTM requirement says, if the bead expands more than 50%, it must be able to pass through a 20 millimeter diameter test gauge while applying a force of up to four and a half pounds to the expanded bead. Shown on the right is a drawing and depiction of this test gauge. The size of 20 millimeter was selected by ASTM as being the limiting factor. It is based on the size of the pyloric sphincter of an 18 month old child. For reference, the pyloric sphincter is located at the end of the stomach and leads into the small intestine. However, staff has not found this to be representative of incidents. Instead, Incidents have shown beads able to pass through the pyloric sphincter and then create blockages at the ileocecal valve, which is located at the end of the small intestine. The force application of four and a half pounds was selected by ASTM to represent a minimal force value simulating muscular action of the pyloric sphincter. However, when the four and a half pound force is applied during testing, the expanded bead may break apart, as shown on the bottom left, which was a 30 millimeter diameter bead. In most cases, much less force is required to break the bead. Again, this is not representative of incident data because our incident information shows water beads passing through the pyloric sphincter and remaining whole while creating blockages at the ileocecal valve. Next slide, please. 
Shown here is a visual aid and flow chart illustrating the gastrointestinal tract. Note, the pyloric sphincter located at the end of the stomach leads into the small intestine, and the ileocecal valve is located at the end of the small intestine. Next slide, please. ASTM has recently put out a proposed revision for ballot. This contains proposed revisions specific to water beads. In this proposed revision, if the bead expands more than 50%, it must be able to pass through a 12 millimeter diameter funnel gauge while applying a force of up to 0.1 pounds to the expanded bead. Shown here is a drawing and depiction of that funnel gauge. ASTM based a 12 millimeter diameter gauge off of an incident where a 13 month old swallowed a bead, which caused a blockage. This bead was presumed to have expanded to as small as 13 millimeter diameter. However, staff recommends a gauge smaller than 12 millimeter diameter because while this specific incident confirms the size of an expanded bead capable of causing a blockage at the ileocecal valve, it does not confirm the size of an expanded bead able to successfully pass through without causing a blockage. Staff has evidence of expanded beads ranging from 9.32 millimeter diameter to 15.2 millimeter diameter successfully passing through after the use of an enema. In this incident, approximately 200 beads passed naturally and another 1,000 passed after the use of the enema. As such, there is some uncertainty about where in the 9.32 to 15.2 millimeter diameter range that a bead will pass safely through the entire digestive tract. Because of this uncertainty and the variability between children of different ages and genders, staff recommends setting the allowed size bead to be based on the smallest size bead that passed after being treated with the enema. Therefore, staff will be recommending a funnel gauge of nine millimeter diameter. ASTM also recommends that an expanded bead, which breaks apart during the 0.1 pound force application as meeting the requirement. However, staff disagrees. Based on incident information, staff has evidence of whole beads causing blockages and whole beads successfully passing through after ingestion. Instead, a bead breaking apart during testing could be a false representation of the water bead being safe. For example, the bead breaking apart could be caused by mishandling during testing. Next slide, please. The European standard also has an expanding material requirement. Water beads under this rule are required to not grow more than 50% of their original size. However, this limit could still allow for a hazardous bead. For example, a bead having an original diameter of 9 millimeter, which grows to 13.5 millimeter diameter, would be acceptable under the standard. But as stated earlier, staff has incident data showing a bead being swallowed, expanding the 13 millimeter diameter, and then causing a blockage. Therefore, the European requirements on their own are not sufficient in preventing blockages. Next slide, please. Next, we will discuss acrylamide limits within the voluntary standards. Currently, ASTM F963 does not provide a test method or limit for acrylamide and water beads. Additionally, while EN71 has an acrylamide concentration limit for toys, this limit is not specific to water beads and instead is based on an acrylamide exposure from toys likely or intended to be licked, chewed, or sucked on for a long period of time, such as teethers and rattles. This does not address acrylamide exposure from water beads which are ingested, inserted, or aspirated. Therefore, staff will be recommending a different test method and different limit. Next slide, please. Lastly, regarding labeling requirements, ASTM F963 currently requires only a broad small part choking hazard warning label for toy water bead products because they contain small beads. However, this is only a general warning statement. It does not address or inform about injuries and deaths that have occurred when swallowing or inserting water beads into ears and noses. Next slide, please. Next, I will go through the draft proposed rule, which includes three requirements. First, mechanical requirements to limit expansion. Second, acrylamide limits to prevent possible overexposure to acrylamide. And third, warning and instructional literature requirements. Next slide, please. First, I will go over the recommended mechanical requirements. Staff is recommending a rule that takes from both the ASTM and European requirements. However, staff recommends a funnel gauge diameter of nine millimeter and not applying a force to the expanded bead. Here is a cross-sectional drawing of our proposed funnel test gauge. And additionally, I have an example of what the gauge would look like in a lab.
This rule will require the water bead to not expand more than 50% of its original size. Additionally, once fully expanded, the bead must remain whole while completely passing through the nine millimeter diameter gauge under the force of its own weight. The test will be performed by placing the expanded bead on the upper surface of the funnel and then observing if the bead is able to completely and wholly pass through the bottom once released. As stated previously, nine millimeter was selected based on incident data showing successful passage of expanded beads being as small as 9.32 millimeter diameter and as large as 15.2 millimeter diameter. Staff is also not including a force application that ASTM suggests because a water bead passing through a funnel gauge under its own weight better represents a water bead passing through a child's gastrointestinal tract. While staff recommends the nine millimeter size limit based on preventing intestinal blockages, staff is also recommending the 50% expansion limit, which will additionally reduce potential damage to inner ear structures or nasal tissue if a child inserts a bead into their ear or nose. Reducing expansion to 50% or below will also reduce the degree of bronchial obstruction created when a water bead is aspirated. Next slide, please. Next are recommended acrylamide limits and test method. Water beads containing high levels of acrylamide monomer are toxic. Therefore, the NPR proposes to establish content limits and test methods to address the toxicity hazard. Staff is proposing 65 micrograms as a limit for extractable acrylamide. The test will consist of placing either 100 small dehydrated beads or one large dehydrated bead into a container of deionized water, then placing the container in a heated shaker bath for 24 hours. Note, small beads are defined as being less than four millimeter diameter when dehydrated, and large beads are defined as being four millimeter diameter or larger when dehydrated. Once complete, the volume of water will be analyzed for amount of acrylamide. Staff is proposing this 65 microgram limit based off of research provided by the ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. The ATSDR published an acute duration oral minimal risk level for acrylamide. And when assessing the appropriate acrylamide limit, staff used this information along with the fifth percentile body weight of a six month old female to determine a safe limit for acute exposure. Next slide, please. Last are the recommended warnings and instructional literature requirement. Shown here is an example of a warning label that will be placed on a toy, such as an experiment kit containing water beads. Staff is recommending product warnings that include description of the hazard, information about consequences of exposure to the hazard, and instructions regarding appropriate hazard avoidance behaviors. Providing more explicit information and warnings has been found to increase warning effectiveness. Next slide, please. Here we have another example of a warning that we placed that, excuse me, that would be applied to a toy product that is designed to retain water beads, such as a toy squeeze ball. This warning is similar to the previous. However, it states to discard the toy if beads are coming out. Next slide, please. The expected benefits of this proposed rule include reducing gastrointestinal blockages caused by ingesting water beads, reducing inner ear and nasal tissue damage caused by water beads inserted into ears and noses, reducing the degree of bronchial obstruction caused by aspirated water beads, reducing incidence of children choking on expanded water beads, and preventing, preventing future acrylamide poisoning uh, due to water beads. Next slide, please. Now I will discuss the small business impact, excuse me, the potential small business impact. CPSC staff have found more than 30 firms supply toy water bead products to the U.S. market. This proposed rule would have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small businesses, primarily from redesign costs in the first year that the final rule would be effective. Next slide, please. Staff is recommending the commission publish the notice of proposed rulemaking for toy water beads with an effective date of 90 days after publication of the final rule. Additionally, staff looks forward to receiving comment on the recommended effective date and feedback on the recommended performance requirements. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to thank the Waterbeat team members who are listed on this slide for the hard work and professional effort to bring you this draft proposed rule today. Thank you, and we're now available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Cressy and Mr. Rice, um, appreciate the presentation and the work that's gone into uh, the 
proposed rule, uh, uh, no proposed rulemaking. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners. I'm going to start with myself for 10 minutes. Um, uh, I was interested, you were talking about the testing for acrylamide. Oftentimes what we see uh, is that children swallow, swallow many of these. And, you know, there have been horrible pictures of children who have, have even hundreds of these beads in, inside of them. Um, do you think that the, the the testing, the number of beads that are being placed in the testing will provide an accurate representation of what the experience of those children would be? So, yes. Um... We, we typically get reports of children grabbing handfuls of water beads if they're really small. Uh, that's why we chose the number of 100. Uh, our, our reports also say if the beads are larger, the six or seven millimeter size, they'll typically just grab one bead and then ingest them. So that's why we chose the delineation between small beads, 100 of them, and large beads, one, for our acrylamide testing. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear from comments as we could uh, to extend this go exactly. forward as well. Uh, the other, also, I've heard um, reported um, incidents of potentially clumping with beads coming together. And so, in that case, where you have, as you said, grabbing a handful of these beads uh, that are small, swallowing them, and uh, then having multiple at the, you know, potentially at a, a choke point. Um, does the uh, proposed notice rulemaking? Look at that issue, ask questions about the issues. How would that, is that being considered in this? So, um, at the moment, we're not ruled or we haven't found evidence of water beads plumping together. Um, and that's in incident investigations. That's also in lab testing, trying to recreate it. Um, what commonly happens is a, a water bead um, starts a blockage. Several other beads pile on top. Um, and yes, they will get pressed down or compacted. But they still remain separate. We're not seeing instances of them sticking together or forming a one large single mass. Um, however, we're not rolling it out. Um, we have requested comments because we'd like to hear if there is a um, if there's a specific product that exists that we're not aware of, or even a specific scenario that we haven't explored. Uh, so we'd like to hear back from the public. Yeah, as would I. Um... And then it seems that you have two different uh, elements to the proposed testing that you're talking about. One is the size of the bead and one is the, the expansion of the bead. And they seem to be from your presentation directed at the two different sets of risks associated. It seems that the size is focused on ingestion um, where the expansion is focused on the insertion and potential inhalation. Do, do you have a sense of, for the instance where there is uh, inhal inhalation or insertion that the size of the beads are that have been found and in going into sure. individuals? So, um, addressing insertion for ears and noses, um, we know some beads have larger growth potential, uh, which allows them to grow deeper into the nasal cavity or ear canal. Um, this also makes them uh, a lot more difficult to remove uh, in one piece uh, without invasive surgery, without going under sedation. Uh, so the 50% expansion limit, uh, that will keep expanded beads smaller uh, and more likely to be easier to be removed in one piece, such as uh, little toy pieces or food products or small marbles. Um, regarding aspiration, um, again, the 50% expansion limit should address this. Uh, we have an incident where an um, 18 month old child uh, aspirated um, several beads, uh, required surgery to be removed. Uh, evidence had shown uh, these beads started around two to three millimeter and then expanded to the size of a dime, which is about 18 or 19 millimeter. Um, under this rule, um, those same beads would not be allowed to expand to 18 millimeter. They would only be able to expand to the three or four millimeter as long as they remained under that 50% limit. Thank you. Appreciate it. I look uh, forward to uh, hearing from my fellow commissioners on this as well. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, did you have questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you can see from behind me, I, I am not in Bethesda. I am in Winston-Salem, North Carolina uh, for a meeting with uh, members of the North Carolina congressional delegation, uh, some of our important field staff uh, here in state, as well as other agency stakeholders. Uh, so I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate using the remote option. Uh, Mr. Cressy and Mr. Vice, uh, I, I want to thank you uh, in particular and the rest of the water bead team, uh, not only for your work on the proposal, but for putting together today's briefing in the slide deck. 
Um, I also want to thank and recognize the uh, families and advocates who have worked tirelessly to draw attention and awareness to the risks associated with this product category uh, without their work and, and uh, I think in particular the work of Ashley Hogan, I, I don't believe we would be having this meeting today. Uh, and I am concerned about this product category. I'm pleased that we're now here discussing potential solutions to improve safety and protect children, uh, which are among the most vulnerable groups under our purview. Uh, I don't have any questions for staff. Uh, I, I may have some questions for staff during the closed session where we'll, we will have an opportunity uh, to hear directly from our attorneys, uh, our rules. Uh, uh, should not only be robust and feasible, uh, but also need to be legally defensible in order to withstand scrutiny. Uh, in any event, uh, I'd like to get this rule proposal out for comment as, as, as quickly as possible. I think today's briefing is an important step in that direction. And for that, I, I want to offer my thanks to staff for all of their hard work. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all the work that staff has been pouring into water beads. It is apparent um, from from everyone watching here that it has been an, a priority. The recalls, the unilaterals, the the warnings to the public, the acrylamide testing, and now this proposed rule. I, I think this is really a model for how we should approach emerging hazards. And so I thank you for everything you've done thus far and, and what you will do on this. Um, my my first question is on what the proposed rule covers and and what it doesn't, and and so items or items designed, manufactured, or marketed as a plaything for children under fourteen years of age are in scope. Other water beads are not, and the package gives the specific example of water beads used for decorative purposes, like placement in a in a candle holder, as out of scope. And, and so I just want to understand how we'll look at this and, and how we would determine which camp an item might fall into. Um, and so let's assume the proposal goes into effect uh, and you run a search on an online retail platform for water bead and you see results with pictures of colorful beads. Maybe there's a kid's hand in the image. Uh, maybe they're the same pictures that a company previously used when they were selling these as a toy. Um, before the rule, but now the words don't, the listing doesn't say toy, doesn't say kids. Instead, they say something like decorative purposes. Uh, but if those are ingested or inserted, they're going to pose the same hazard. So, so my question is, how would we assess a scenario like that as to, is it in scope or out of scope? So compliance, uh, when they're enforcing the rule, if it's finalized, can use any information uh, to um, build their case. So, for example, if a product was sold as a toy before um, and is known as a toy, but suddenly the marketing changes, but it's obvious in marketing or, or advertising that it's still a toy, compliance can take that into effect in their um, investigation and uh, determination of whether it uh, falls under the scope of the rule. So, so would those kind of things that I mentioned using the same image, children's hands, you know, would those be the kind of things that we can consider there as, as this is a toy? Right. So those are compliance can use any uh, evidence they have uh, to determine whether a product is a toy or not. Okay. Uh, on page OS 25 of the package, uh, it notes that, quote, children are prone to ingest or insert small, smooth, colorful objects like water beads. And so that, that colorful is what I wanted to ask about. Have we considered using color uh, in determining whether items are designed, manufactured, or marketed as a plaything for children under 14 years of age? So I think it would be the, the same answer that uh, compliance can use all of the information they have to determine whether a uh, product is a toy uh, and they are technical staff in any compliance case uh, would evaluate the product to see uh, if it meets the requirements and if it's a toy or not. So if the proposal went into effect, I get that's what we what we would do. But but I guess my question is, should we consider making that one of the things we explicitly uh, consider? Because you know I I haven't heard reasons why vase fillers might need to be multiple bright colors, like the example sitting on the table. You know they could be clear, and and so uh, should we consider adding clear to the requirements in order to fall outside of the scope of the rule? I believe the uh, definition um, of our of our scope of water bead is uh, typically colorful, um, so they do, that doesn't rule out clear. Okay, well, maybe it's one of the things we should consider, and maybe we get comments on that that, that could direct us one way or the other. But 
you know, I, I, I'd hope we consider ways because what I want to avoid is relying too narrowly on the just the direct words in the marketing. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear you say that we wouldn't. We would look at the full picture and make an assessment, but it makes the job a little bit more difficult um, if if we can see listings for the same product that they just switch the name and wait to get caught. Um, so I'd hope we keep that in mind, and I'm sure we will going forward. Um, the other one uh, issue I wanted to ask about was it, it looked like 51% of the incidents from the NICE uh, projections were ear and nose insertions. So you started to explain a little bit uh, in response to the chair about how the rule would protect against ear and, ear and nose insertions. But can you just walk us through how that 50% expansion is protective in those scenarios? Sure. So um, uh, ear impaction uh, can occur within a range of sizes. Uh, however, the uh, the fifty percent expansion limit uh, addresses the hazard of larger expanding beads uh, growing deeper into the ear canal, um, and that's regardless of ear canal size. Uh, if that bead is there, it can grow with the path of least resistance. Uh, so, by limiting um, the size to fifty percent growth, uh, we are limiting uh, instances instances of invasive surgery and severe injury. Um, and additionally, the NPR is uh, including questions, uh, seeking comment on this as well. Okay, and maybe there we'll get some information because I, I don't know what the ear canal or the nasal canal look like or the sizes. Do we have information or, or do we maybe want to get that through comment on those sizes? Similar to the ileocecal valve sizes as digestion, we'd like to get comment on um, in ear canal sizes. Okay, well. yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to take a look at that if we do get those to see how this would all interact. Um, on... OS 43 in the package, we say we have no incidents of chronic exposure. Can you walk us through what, what definition we're using for chronic exposure? Sure. So um, a bead can be swallowed and remain in a, a child's uh, digestive tract for several days. Um, we consider that still an acute, an acute event. Um, what happens is the, um, the, the bead, the acrylamide within the bead will be extracted within 24 hours. Um, we know this because uh, we've done tests for a 24 hour period of time and a seven day period of time. And both the 24 hour period of time and the seven day period of time have same or have similar uh, acrylamide extraction results. Okay, so so with the chronic exposure, that's why we would be looking at continual new ingestion, is that? Right, um, the bead itself is not continually giving a new dose of acrylamide over a long period of time. It's just within that 24 hour period that the acrylamide is extracted. I see. So, so even if a bead stayed within, you know, you said it typically passes in a pretty short amount of time, but what if a bead stayed in for many months uh, without passing? We're, we're still not considering that a chronic exposure. Right. The, um, the exposure happens within 24 hours. Okay. Um, so uh, another thing that chair asked about, I just wanted to, to follow up on, uh, and I appreciate that we're asking for comment on whether any water bead products present adhesive properties that would allow them to stick together. Um, but I question, I, I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts on whether phrasing it that way, I mean, are we focusing too narrowly on the water beads sticking together? Should we be asking also, is there a scenario where they can stick together with other things, you know, food, mucus, et cetera, to, to form an obstruction? Right. Um, so yeah, exactly, uh, perfect point. Um, there could be a scenario that we're not aware of. In our lab testing, we focused on different temperatures, uh, different um, different if different brands. But yeah, within the digestive system, there could be anything. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's why we're seeking comment on that, and we're not ruling it out. Great. Okay. Um, in which countries are water beads primarily manufactured? Uh, Mr. Moscoso, welcome. Morning. Thank you. Um, uh, so we find that the manufacturers are mostly in Asia, and we, we suspect in China mostly. Okay. Are, have we identified any specific U.S. small business that you know to be manufacturing water beads? In, in uh, our assessment and looking up, we found two firms that had U.S. addresses, um, one in Kane County, Illinois, one in uh, Wellington, New Jersey, uh, not a lot of information on it, but both appear to be small businesses so run out of residential areas. And both appear to be manufacturing? No, one seems to be uh, probably an importer, and the other seems to be a small arts and crafts store that uh, may be importing, but it may also be making their own water beads. So 
so with that potential one aside, that is the only incidence we have any knowledge that there may be a small U.S. firm manufacturing. In our assessment at, at that, uh, when the analysis was done, I, I do want to stress this is a low barrier market. So there are markets that are companies that come in and exit the market. Uh, so things may have changed. So we have left it open-ended saying most, most U.S. manufacturers are small business. Um, but again, it's a low barrier market. Folks okay. come in and out, but but it's also we we don't have knowledge that any U.S. firms no we definitively don't have not, are have manufacturing that right now. Okay, so we're conservatively estimating that some might be, but we don't know any that are correct. I appreciate that. Thank you all so much, and appreciate the work here. Um, thank you, Mr. Moyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cressy and Mr. Vice for your very uh, good work on this project. I also want to add my thanks to the parent advocates who have um, done so much to bring this to the attention of the commission and turn their personal pain into helping others. That has been crucial to getting us to the point where we are today. So thanks very much to them. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I guess I want to just start with timeline and just to clarify something, Mr. Cressy, on uh, page OS9, uh, uh, the package indicates that uh, um, staff worked with the ASTM subcommittee since 2009 to update the toy standard and discuss hazards associated with water beads. So I just want to clarify whether that was a general statement about staff working with the toy committee or whether that specifically was a reference to work with water beads. Yeah, specifically water beads uh, is a more recent issue. Um, I believe we met, we started a meeting with ASTM last year. Um, this year we've met twice. Um, and again, they've also put out a, a, pro a proposed uh, revision as well. Okay, so that was a general statement. It wasn't about water beads. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Do you have information on when water beads were introduced into the market? I don't have an answer on that one at the moment. I can get back to you. Okay, and see what, yeah. that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to follow up a little bit on what uh, Commissioner Trumpko was asking about in terms of um, decorative uh, uses of products for decorative purposes. So. Um, would you say there's a strong likelihood that a child uh, could access a stray bead from a decorative kit just as likely as from a toy or a, a, a toy product? I would say that's possible. Okay. So are you concerned that there will be a shift, even if it's a legitimate, not to disguise a toy, but there's a legitimate shift to um, uh, uses of these products for decorative purposes? Are we concerned that the, the problem is just going to shift as opposed to be solved by the rule? Um, yes, I, it certainly could be a concern. Um, at, at this moment, uh, this was directed on our FY24 plan to focus on toys and through Section 106. So if that were to happen in the future, um, I believe we could certainly take a look if, um, if basically manufacturers decide to shift to decorative purposes or household purposes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Can I just, I see them on the table. Are all water beads round? We have not seen anything other than round at the moment. Yes. Okay. And is the shape significant? Does it matter? In, in, in We're including various shapes in our definition because if there is a manufacturing ability to make star shapes, uh, we want to be inclusive. So okay. by, by saying just round, if they made a star shape, that would not meet the definition and be out of scope. So I see. Okay. We want to avoid that. But we haven't seen anything a different shape. Correct. Okay. Alrighty. Um, and then uh, I also want to ask about just the ingestion process and again, a kind of a timing issue. Um, uh, you state that the water bees remain, they don't remain in the stomach for a long time and they pass. How long does it take for a bee to expand? You may have said this. I just, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Uh, depending on the um, original size, um, for example, uh, these two beads here, um, if they're going to expand to about 17 millimeter or even eight millimeter within three to four hours. Three to four hours. Okay. Uh, these larger ones, about two to three days. Okay, that's there. I thought that maybe from they were expanded beads. Those are beads in their original state. No, these are the expanded. They beads. are okay. Um, I see. I'm sorry. When we get to it, I do have both the original size versus the expanded size for a visual for for you all. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have that now? Do you I really? do. Okay, I that would be up? great. Sure. Okay. Well, if that's okay with the chair. <laughs>
Oh. Start from the top. Okay. These uh, blue beads here, uh, they'll start at about about two millimeter size, uh, and then about four hours they'll meet they'll reach their maximum size of um, eight millimeter. So while these pass through our nine millimeter funnel, they won't meet our fifty percent limit. Okay. These other ones they vary. Um, still start about two to three millimeter, but they can go up to seventeen. And uh, I think this is about 10 millimeter. So neither of these would pass through our gauge and neither of them would meet our 50% expansion limit. And I brought these as well. Um, these wouldn't even meet the current ASTM, but uh, they do start at a little larger size, about that six, seven millimeter. And then they expand to about two inches. If you guys can see. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dizak, I'll come over to you so you can see as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Cressy. Appreciate it. Uh, actually, you mentioned uh, uh, ASTM. Is there? Do you know what the level of compliance? You said one of them didn't even comply with uh, ASTM currently. Do, do you have a sense of what level of compliance there is? Um, I don't really have a strong answer for that, as far as like the products on the market currently. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. Uh, I do have a question about the recalls that you mentioned in the package. Uh, I noticed that there was a gap uh, in in timing in terms of recalls that there were recalls in 2013 and then not again for uh, a 10 year period. Is there, can you uh, give me an explanation if you have one as to why that is? Um, I don't have an explanation at our today. In terms of incidents, sorry. Right, yeah, I, yeah, based on incidents, um, I don't have an explanation as why there was a gap between recalls today, um, but I can follow up with our compliance team and see. Um, okay, and I'd be interested to learn if there was a difference in the hazard patterns from 10 years ago, whether there's been an evolution in what the hazards are, um, and to the extent, um, I guess my question would be whether of the dimensions uh, of the products have changed and whether that affects risk. I noticed in the two of the recalls, the reference, they referenced specifically our release reference that they were marble size. And I'd be curious, and maybe you know, whether there's been a change in the size of water beads over this period. Right. Um, I, I know in the past three years, that's kind of what we've been focused on. Um, over 10 years ago, I can't really have an answer for that. Um, but yeah, I can follow up with compliance as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then on acrylamide, um, uh, I think you addressed this, but if you would uh, explain a little bit uh, in more detail why the EN seventy one nine standard is insufficient. It focuses on licking. Is that if you could explain a little bit more what the uh, difference is and why that's not sufficient to address the acrylamide hazard? Sure. So the um, the European standard, uh, their acrylamide standard, uh, focuses on um, toys such as like pacifiers or um, teethers um, that would be licked or sucked on for an extremely long period of time. Um, it doesn't really compare to what happens with water beads, where you know they put them in their mouth, swallow them, and then it stays within a system here for um, for a couple of days, several days. Uh, the, the the acrylamide is extracted within 24 hours. Um, I believe. The European standard focuses more on long-term exposure, pacifiers, and um, and uh, teeters. Okay, because if I understood what you said to Commissioner Trumpka, it's sort of like a one-time exposure. It's not a chronic exposure from the ingestion. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Within a 24-hour period. Okay. Um, um, and in terms of um, the assessment of the acrylamide limit, you selected the fifth percentile body weight of a 68 month old female. Can you explain why you did that? Um, yes, our, our our data showed um, age ranges between nine months to 11 years old. Uh, so we chose some or the age smaller than a, mine, a nine month old, which would land it on the, the six to eight month old size. And that's more protective, uh, would you say? Is that why you I would say that? Okay. Well. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, were there other gender differences in terms of the incidents uh, that you're aware of? I don't recall at the moment. Um, 
I can, I know it's in the NPR package, so I can definitely get okay. back to you on that. All right. Thank you. I do appreciate that. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for your work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Good morning. Uh, first, uh, I'd reiterate, uh, and echo the thank you to all of the advocates whose work brought us here today. I think until they uh, came to the commission, I was not aware of this product candidly. Uh, I think some of the statements we've heard today suggests I'm not the only one who this is a relatively new product for. So thank you for that. I'd also note in, in the water bee team, there are 10 people listed. There are only two of you up here. So I thank you all, but also the 10 people who I know spent a lot of time, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, working on this, uh, this issue. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to have some questions for the executive session, uh, but a couple uh, of questions here. Uh, I want to follow up. Uh, Commissioner Trump uh, asked about the 30 firms. Uh, I had similar questions, and I'm going to ask slightly different iterations of that. Uh, would the cost of complying with the new rule be borne by retailers primarily or by the, uh, I think, as you said, primarily uh, Asian and likely Chinese manufacturers uh, should the rule go into effect? Uh, so we we didn't determine that. Um... Uh, I can't say definitively it would be borne by initially the manufacturers and then my assumption as in general consumer products, some percentage of that would be pushed on to retailers and to consumers. But that's going to depend largely on the number of manufacturers and what their profit margins, et cetera, are. And how Correct. Much. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and then for the, the small businesses, uh, you mentioned it's not clear uh, that they're manufacturing uh, given there are chemicals involved, uh, I, I think that's worth tying down for a small business analysis to determine if they are actually manufacturing, if that's possible. Uh, uh, largely, the market is importers and retailers with a handful of manufacturers. With, with a handful of manufacturers in Asia, likely China. Correct. Okay. That, as our assessment of it, it again, it's an opaque, dynamic market, but that's our assessment. Okay. Um, switching gears, and it, this was actually probably for you as well. Uh, on the NICE data, uh, the estimate uh, is, and I, I think it's in, uh, it's a, a credit to our NICE system, which I understand uh, from talking to staff is uh, the envy of, of of the world in terms of a, a model to estimate uh, incidents. Is that sixty three? Was that a median? Uh, and if so, what was the upper bound range? So are we being conservative or? We're using the median, it's not necessarily being conservative, but are we, what would be the upper bound range if there was a range of, of numbers considered for the number of incidents, uh, i.e., could we be undercounting using that 6,300 incidents? I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. I think that would be interesting and helpful to, to, to include. Um, last but not least, and I think this is for Mr. Vice, but maybe Mr. Cressy, so uh, I apologize. Uh, just to be clear in my understanding from reading uh, the, the very thorough staff packages, this specifically excludes agricultural uses. Is that correct? And, and can you talk a little bit about how that determination would be made? I know Commissioner Trump was uh, concerned, and I think we're all concerned about companies coming in and saying they're one thing when they're really another. But my understanding is the history of these products is they actually were originally used primarily for agricultural uh, purposes and 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 that seeped into the, the arts and crafts arena and then that seeped into to toys but perhaps that's wrong but I'd I'd like to walk through the, that those questions please uh, right so the the scope of the rule is limited to toys um, when we're looking to um, enforce the rule uh, we our staff would take into account all the available information they have to make that determination. Uh, so it's a fact specific determination based on each specific product. But if a, if a product is an agricultural product and not a toy, uh, then it would be outside the scope of the rule. Uh, that all depends on how it's marketed um, and designed and uh, other factors that compliance would use in looking to see how the product is sold, uh, advertising, um, that sort of thing. In, in following up on that, I had looked at some e-commerce platforms. I think where a lot of these are these these products are sold. I've primarily seen them sold as toys or arts and crafts. I'd not seen them as an agricultural product. Uh, are they? When I'm wondering out loud, what is, how is an agricultural product defined, and how are those sold through the same channels, or is it a different set of channels? For example, 
you know, an agricultural product supply store versus uh, an arts and crafts store versus a, a, a toy section of either an e-commerce platform or a bricks and mortar store. Do you know? I don't think the rule um, gets into that because its focus was on toys, so it okay. didn't look at how products that aren't toys are sold. Um, but that is a relevant factor. So, for example, if a product is sold only at an agricultural supply company, only um, at a uh, commercial level, uh, that would certainly be relevant in determining that that product uh, probably is not a toy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Actually, just one follow up uh, clarifying question, Cressy. You had said that the, one of the water beads doesn't even meet the ASTM standard. Um, but uh, from what you said before, if you had a large bead that's larger than, but provide a small amount of pressure and it went through the hole, would that still meet the standard, the ASTM standard? Sorry, I misspoke. Um, ASTM and our team, we, we have a disagreement because they don't state in their current standard. That if the bead breaks apart, it meets the standard. Our interpretation when reading the ASTM requirement is that if the bead breaks apart, it does not meet the standard. ASTM's interpretation is that if it does break apart, then it meets the standard. So that's why um, we want to be clear in our proposed rule that if the bead breaks apart, it does not meet the standard. Appreciate the clarification. Um, thank you again uh, for both the presentation and for uh, uh, all the work that the team has done to get to this point in time, um, and also to the commissioners for their active participation, and thanks to the uh, Office of the Secretary, Facilities Communications for your assistance with this briefing. Um, there has been a request for a closed executive session to address a legal question, so at this point in time, we're going to clear the room of anyone who is not uh, allowed to be there and then reconvene five minutes for the closed executive session. Uh, thank you again very much.